I, you know, I always tell them I feel that you're far more likely to ever fall down in your life than you are to have to use other types of martial arts techniques. How's it going? Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 530, with today's guest, Sensei Andy Sloan. If you're new to the sound of my voice, you may not know my name. It's Jeremy Lesniak. I'm your host here for the show. I'm the founder here at Whistlekick. I love martial arts. I love training, and I love talking about it. And that has led to the last five years of my life, plus 500 and something episodes. Well, it's 530. 530 episodes talking about traditional martial arts, and that's what we're doing again today. If you want to check out the other episodes we've done, go to WhistlekickMartialArtsRadio.com. And if you want to check out all the things that we're doing, go to Whistlekick.com. That's our online home. It's also the easiest way to find our products, our programs, and links to the other things we're involved in. If you use the code PODCAST15, it's going to get you 15% off everything we've got over there. Make sure you hit WhistlekickMartialArtsRadio.com for the latest on this show. You can sign up for our newsletter at either site, and we're bringing you new stuff multiple times per week. In fact, if you add it all up, there's a lot between podcast and social media and newsletters and all of it. There's an amazing amount that we're putting out. And if you want to support that, if you value that, you've got a number of ways you can show that appreciation. You can make a purchase. You could share an episode. Follow us on social media. We're at Whistlekick everywhere you could think of. You could tell a friend, pick up a book on Amazon, leave a review, or support our Patreon effort. Patreon.com slash Whistlekick. It's the place to go for that. You can support with as little as $2 a month, and you're going to get original content at every tier. So at $5, you get exclusive audio, $10 exclusive video, and it just keeps going up from there. $2, you're getting exclusive blog posts. Check it out. Help us pay for this show. Help us put out more, better, continued stuff to support the traditional martial arts world. Goal setting is important. We've talked about that on this show. We've heard it from a number of guests. But today's guest had a target, a place that he wanted to end up, and he got there. And he talks about how he got there, why he got there, and what it's been like while he's been there. Since Andy Sloan grew up training in karate and ended up in Okinawa. But as you might imagine, it wasn't a linear path. There were some things that happened in between. In fact, quite a few of them and we talk about many of them. So let's talk about his journey. I bet you'll relate some of your life to his. Sensei Sloan, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Thank you for having me. Of course, thanks for, thanks for being here. Now, we've got a, quite a bit of a time difference going on, don't we? That's right. 9 a.m. here as we're recording, and, and you said it was, what, 10 p.m.? That's right. Well, first off, I want to thank you for talking to me I, i'm i'm assuming you're not nocturnal so before bed uh yes <laughs> not, not something that everybody's willing to do so i really do appreciate that and you know what i'm i'm gonna guess there's a story there so let's start with that story where are you that it's the other side of the world well i am in okinawa japan as a matter of fact <clears throat> so um i'm stationed here in the navy and I've been very fortunate to have been stationed in Okinawa for a total of 10 years this month. Oh, wow. That's, that's quite the anniversary. Yeah. I've been overseas I've, I, 12 years of my 14 years in the Navy. Wow. And I did 26 months in Korea, and then the rest of my time has been here in Okinawa. But I've been overseas, and I've only had one duty station there in the United States. <laughs> now, forgive my ignorance. I thought people got moved around more often than that. Well, they do, largely, but, um, you know, every command has to have admin people, and so I am an admin person, and as long as you stay within your sea to shore flow for your particular job field, then the chances are that you could potentially go, you know, to some individual area repeatedly if you bounce around from different commands. If, as long as they have a billet open for you in your job field for your pay grade, then, you know, chances are you might get it. If nobody else wants to go to it, or if the Navy thinks that it's cost efficient for them. Mm. And, you know, since I was already on the island since 2014, that was a, that allowed me to go to another unit next door to where I was working when the time came. Okay. And then again, I moved over to another unit earlier this year. So I'll be here till 2023. Wow. 
Wow. Now, of course, this is a martial arts show, and Okinawa being such a, a hot spot and a historically relevant place for martial arts, I'm sure the audience is listening saying, okay, so which came first? So that's my first question to you. Which came first, Okinawa or martial arts? Martial arts. Tell us about that. How, how, did, how did that happen? So I started in January of 1991 when I was in middle school in Louisiana northwestern Louisiana, and the, um, the, the school that I went to, Herndon Magnet School, used to have two PE teachers, and one of the PE teachers uh, was the girls' volleyball coach and softball coach, and one of the PE teachers, as I said, but she also uh, was a black belt in judo, and so half the year, you could choose uh, between judo or archery, and then the other half of the year, you do the normal PE stuff. So each, uh, one semester, each of my sixth, seventh, and eighth grade years, I did judo. Wow. So that's how I got started in formal martial arts training. And <clears throat> what made you choose judo over archery? Well, I had always uh, seen, you know, martial arts stuff on television. Uh, Chuck Norris movies and stuff like that. Bruce Lee movies, of course. Those were, uh, you know, still pretty popular back then. And, of course, they had the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles cartoon at that time in the late 80s and into the early 90s. It was still popular. And, of course, then they came out with the live-action Ninja Turtles movies, too, around that time. And I was just interested in martial arts. So when I had the opportunity to do judo, I went for it. Hmm. Now, you said that this was a, a one-semester program. So what was it like at the end of that first semester? Had you fully embraced it? Was judo your new life's passion or was it just something you did at school? It was really just something that we did there at the school. Um, you know, and once, so I, as I recall, uh, that was the, um, the second semester of that year. Um, I guess it would have to be, wouldn't it, if it was January. But uh, anyhow, so anyway, yeah, after I got out of the sixth grade, you know, of course, over the summertime, I couldn't really do anything. And then we took it back up and I think the seventh grade year, they actually had it the first semester. And so, but anyway, like I say, it was just during the school year, but only one semester of it. So there was a time when I was doing it and time when I was not doing it. And over the summer break, of course, I wasn't doing it. But, you know, I really enjoyed it and I had fun. So that was the main thing, I guess, is at that age that I was having fun with it. Okay, so the, the opportunity for judo ends in eighth grade, you get through that semester, yep. and then what happens? So over the summer of 1993, because I was out of the eighth grade in the summer of 93, um, my grandmother found a guy that was teaching judo in the Shreveport area where, where we were from. And it's my understanding that he was uh, like a contemporary of my judo teacher's teachers. Um, I'm not exactly positive how accurate that is, but that was my understanding, at least at that time. And I never really delved into it a whole lot necessarily, uh, just telling his background or anything. But uh, so I was a teenager uh, at the time, and I trained with him for a little while into the fall of 93. And uh, around November the 1st, actually it was on November the 1st, is when I started training in Ishinju Karate. So in October, of 93, my grandmother took me to the Louisiana State Fair, and we were at one building, and they had a drawing that you could put your name in the bucket or whatever for a uh, two, three-week membership to the local karate school. And so I'm sure they were giving the uh, free two weeks to everybody to put their name in, you know, but I don't know, a week or so later, they called me and said, hey, you've won these two, three weeks, and come on down if you want to take a lesson and stuff. So my grandmother took me down there, and that was on the 1st of November of 1993, and I was 14 years old at that time, and I'd been 14 for about a month. <clears throat> and, you know, for a little bit there, a couple weeks to a month at least, I was doing judo and karate at the same time. Mm. Uh, a couple of nights a week, I was doing the karate, and a couple of nights a week, I was doing judo. But eventually, karate was more fun, uh, and then I just kind of let the judo go by the wayside. Mm. Do you regret that at all now? No, because, uh, you know, I still 
uh, enjoyed doing the techniques that I learned. I mean, I didn't get very high in the rank system or anything, but I, I learned how to roll and fall really well. And I think that was very, very important. And those are skills that I pass along to my students today. And, I, you know, I always tell them, I feel that you're far more likely to ever fall down in your life than you are to have to use other types of martial arts techniques. So I am sure they've learned how to roll and fall. Uh, and then, you know, last year I actually pursued a, a black belt in jiu-jitsu. So those types of things kind of helped me out. Oh, wow. Interesting. Yeah, it, it's, I've always found it fascinating that so many people point to traditional karate and, and exclude falling and grappling when, you know, I certainly haven't trained at every karate school on earth, but every single one I've trained at has incorporated some manner of falling and some basic grappling. Right. The very first school that I was at, they did as well. Uh, so I'm just, you know, pretty, uh, pretty well ahead of the other students in that regard, at least. So. Okay. So here you are, you're, you're in high school and you're training in, in karate and you're, you're enjoying it. You enjoy it so much that you let judo go. And what are the next few years as you finish up high school? What, what do those hold for you in regard to martial arts? So at that, it's coincidentally, the very day that, um, that I started karate training, my mother had remarried and uh, I learned soon thereafter that she was going to be moving to the Dallas-Fort Worth area. And uh, my stepfather used to work for the FDIC and they had closed the Shreveport office for that and were re relocating everybody to Dallas. And so he uh, and my mother and my two half brothers were going to move over there to the Dallas area. But I didn't want to move in the middle of the school year. So my, my mother let me live there in Shreveport and finish out my freshman year of high school living at my grandmother's house. So I did that and went to the school there until um, the end of May of 94. And then I moved over to Texas. But because my family still mostly lived there in the Shreveport, Bossier City area at that time, uh, we were back and forth all the time from Dallas to Shreveport, which is only like 225 miles away. And like, you know, one weekend a month or something like that. Or, um, and practically every school holiday that I got, summer vacation, and all that kind of stuff, I was back over there. So my original karate teacher never stopped being my teacher, you know, but while I was in the Dallas area, I supplemented my training with another Eastern Jiu teacher, and I took some Taekwondo at different schools during the 90s. Didn't go very far uh, at that point in time in uh, the Taekwondo, but I was still, you know, open to learning different styles and, you know, trying to find out what it was all about. And I used to go to the library there in, in McKinney, Texas, where I used to live, and uh, would just devour any kind of martial arts book or magazine that had a martial arts article in it, something like that that I could find. I just wanted to learn everything I could. And so I just kept going and it took, it probably took a little under seven years to make black belts in karate, but I stuck with it. Wow. That's great. You know, Ishinru is a style that I mentioned to you beforehand that we've seen a bit more coming through on the show, which I find interesting because if you look out in the, the wider world, it's one of the less practiced. I don't have numbers to, to back that up or anything, but I think if we were to do a survey, we'd, we'd see that it was far from the top stylistically. Is that well, something you were aware of back then? It, it probably used to be, uh, well, before I got involved in it anyway, it used to be, I would have to say, probably one of the more well-known and large, large oh, uh, interesting. practice styles. To see, the founder of our style, he had a contract with the 3rd Marine Division Special Services, and the Marine Corps basically paid for the lessons. So they had two karate instructors and two judo instructors on staff over here back in the late 50s and early 60s. Uh, and so the Marines, it was something that they could do in our off time. The Marines that were trying to, Marine Corps was trying to keep them out of trouble so they'd have something to do. And there wasn't anything they were required to do, but many of the uh, the people that took the karate uh, with Shimabuku Tatsuo or Leichi Kanye down in Futenma, they would went back to the States and, and started teaching. So mm. uh, Shimabuku Tatsuo had a lot of students in the States that would teach in the early days. 
and it really grew up in uh, Tennessee and New Jersey and uh, Washington State in the late 50s and early 60s. And so it, it's my understanding from studying the history a fair amount uh, that it was a pretty popular style. And fortunately over here, over the years since then, it's, it's shrunk even more. And uh, due to politics and whatnot, you know, it's almost extinct over here, sadly. Yeah. Yeah, you mentioned New Jersey. That's where some of my martial arts roots come from, Mishinru being one of the styles that I grew up in. Uh, so I'm, I'm familiar with that as a, as a hotbed. And, you know, the, the history of martial arts and how certain styles spread for certain reasons. Here we've got a, you know, sort of geopolitical one. It blows my mind. It just absolutely fascinates me that, that martial arts spreads for reasons up, beyond simply interest. Well, you know, back in the day like that, in the late 50s and early 60s, martial arts in general were largely brand new to the United States. And mm. so you know, it was kind of mysterious and people wanted to know about it. And, you know, people were in awe of those that did it to a degree, seemingly. Yeah. So. All right. So here we are. You're, you're traveling back and forth from Texas to Louisiana. And you were in your black belt. And I'm going to guess at some point, not long after that, you enlist? Uh, no, actually, it was quite a while after that. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I joined the Navy late in life. I was almost 27 when I joined the Navy. And what happened uh, in between those two things then? Well, I was uh, living, I eventually got my own apartment in McKinney. And, uh, but, but, but just before that, I moved back to uh, Louisiana for about seven months. So after I finished high school in 1997, I'm going back a little bit more, um, I was going to the community college there in Collin County, and I got my associate degree there, took about three years to get an associate degree because I didn't really take a full load but one semester, and mm. you know, I just wasn't really focused on school very much at, at that point, so um, my stepfather kind of wanted me to join the workforce or move out or do something if I wasn't going to continue to uh, go to school and so I didn't really have any place else to go so I moved back home to Louisiana to my grandmother's and lived with her for about seven months and went to Louisiana State University Shreveport one semester and like I say I was not really focused on school so I decided I would get a job and I had a friend that uh, helped me get a job back in the Dallas area so I moved back to Dallas and lived in Plano for about three months and then I got my own apartment in McKinney in June of 2002 and I had that apartment for about two and a half years or three years, something like that. Three and a half, maybe. And it wasn't until February of 2006 that I joined the delayed entry program for the Navy. And I went to boot camp in June of 2006. Why? Well, uh, at the time, I was having a difficult time trying to find a, uh, a permanent job. I was working several jobs at once, and though I was, you know, in my mid-20s, I could do it for a while, but, you know, that kind of weighs on somebody having to work every single day of the week. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you can only do that for so long before you get burnt out, so I knew something had to give, and I said, well, you know, my grandfather had been in the Navy for about eight and a half years in a nine-year period between 1942 and 1951. And then my dad had also been in the Navy very briefly in 72 and 73. So I was like, well, let me see what this is all about. And although I wasn't very close to either of them, um, you know, I said, well, here's this family connection. So let me just see what we can do. And my grandfather had already passed away by that point. And uh, my father passed away in 2007. So it wasn't very long after that that he passed away. But, you know, it ended up being something that I had really um, enjoyed for the most part. And, uh, you know, I owe so much to our great country and to the Navy. I mean, pretty much everything I have is in my experiences that I would have never otherwise have are due to my service in the Navy. Mm. A lot of people make comments about the, I, I guess we'll call it the militaristic inspiration that comprises many of the martial arts that we train in today. 
was that something that was did, did you did you notice that at all was there anything that you took from your martial arts when you went into the navy that you said ah this is easier because of that or i am more familiar or more comfortable with this environment because of training well because i was older i was the fourth oldest in my division in troop camp so i was relatively well disciplined already and uh you know to concentrate and i could see the bigger picture of why the, the recruit division commanders were trying to make us do things just so you know i realized that they were trying to prepare people for shipboard life and not having a whole lot of space and you need to do your you know your your bedding just so and keep your belongings in a small little space because you know there's not going to be very much room if you're going on a ship and whatnot and so i could see all that so i wasn't you know, I was not, uh, I didn't have a problem with authority like some of the folks in there did and would get in trouble. And of course, they'd have to punish the whole group. And, and we were not very happy about that. But, you know, so yeah, my discipline and uh, ability to concentrate and things, I, I got a lot of that from my martial arts background. So, you know, I'd already been training in martial arts for a long time at that point. Mm. So, like, <laughs> I would imagine as someone who had trained as long as you had, somebody who had, you know, it, it sounded like really found something that struck you, that, that resonated, that at some point through this process of, of entering the Navy, you were hopeful you would end up somewhere. And if you were training in Ishinru, it would make sense to me that you probably had a pin in a map somewhere for Okinawa. Am I right? Absolutely. That's okay. right. So, you know, I had hoped that potentially I would be able to go to Okinawa. So I chose uh, a job uh, in the Navy that I figured that would help me get there potentially. But also I had a big background in customer service before I joined the Navy. So I wanted to be able to do something in the Navy that I already had a background in. And also it could be something potentially that I could do once I got out of the Navy because I knew that no matter how long I was going to be in the Navy, it was always going to be temporary. So, you know, at that point, I really had only intended to do a four-year enlistment with a one-year extension, and that was going to be it. But then, you know, things kept rolling, and I was like, hey, this isn't so bad, and let me, uh, let me see about another enlistment. And then I did that, and here, let me see about another enlistment. So now it's just gone on for, you know, 14 years now, and I have just a little over five and a half years remaining and I'll be able to retire. Wow. And yeah, so, so, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, keep, keep going, keep going. Well, Talk. I was going to say that when I got to my job training after two months of being in, at uh, boot camp, recruit training there in Great Lakes, Illinois, um, my particular job field as a yeoman, the, the schooling for that is a month long school and it's down in Meridian, Mississippi. So I was down there at Naval Air Station in Meridian for a month. It's a self-paced uh, course, but it, I was there for almost a, pretty much exactly a month. And, you know, they asked you to fill out a dream sheet, basically, you know, where would you like to be stationed? And so, you know, I put down, everybody got to, you know, write down three choices. And so I thought mine were pretty diverse. I wanted to be stationed in uh, Okinawa, Japan, of course, or Rota, Spain, or Washington, D.C., and I didn't get any of the three choices that I asked for, so they stuck me in Oklahoma City. <laughs> I feel like that's the opposite, somehow the opposite of all three of those places. Yeah, you know, so, I mean, at the time, it was a little disappointing, of course, but, you know, it didn't end up being a very bad duty station to be uh, stationed for my very first one. I mean, since I had joined the Navy out of the Dallas area there in Plano, uh, you know, going three and a half hours up the highway to Oklahoma City was a little bit disappointing, but I still got to go home sometimes to visit my parents and, you know, my friends and family there in the Dallas area, students that I had. Did you say students? Yes, I've been teaching since. Oh, uh, we, we, we missed that part. T tell us about that. Oh, I'm sorry. So, yeah, back All in right. 1996, I don't remember exactly when it was probably fall sometime. My original teacher, uh, Harvey Kennedy, uh, there in Shreveport, he had said to me, well, why don't you teach somebody so that you have somebody to practice with? And so that was my permission, as far as I was concerned, to begin teaching. 
And so I began teaching when I was a senior in high school in February of 1997. And what did that look like over the next few years? Well, as you're working uh, all those jobs and such. Well, I mean, I would teach privately. I mean, of course, when I was living in Louisiana briefly in 2001, I went back to the Carranza School and was actually, I was working for Mr. Kennedy as one of his assistant instructors. So I got a, a lot of experience over those months teaching various age groups and stuff. And, you know, I had been teaching my classmates there in uh, high school, one of my friends from one of the classes we were in, we were seniors together. And we used to have class on our lunch break and stuff like that. Our senior year, we had an hour for lunch. So we used to go across the street to the, the lake that was across the way, the park, and, and teaching over there and stuff like that. So I got a little bit of experience of teaching. Uh, and I just tried to hone my ability in teaching and, you know, see what different age groups require, you know, the developmental stage of children and so on. And I really enjoyed doing that. I mean, of course, probably everybody has their age groups that they prefer, but, you know, I, I enjoyed learning how to teach, and I think I'm a fairly decent teacher. Mm. All right. So you're in Oklahoma City. Um, no, no oceans around. That's right. And how do you get from there to Okinawa? Well, first off, how... You know, obviously, there's there's the the side of you that's, you know, interested in traveling. I would imagine everybody I've ever met who went in the Navy was really interested in travel. And then there's the martial arts side of you, the 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 passionate martial artist who, you know, I'm going to guess if if you could have your first three choices would have been Okinawa, Okinawa, Okinawa. <laughs> right. So, taking that hit, and you know, obviously, you you get back up and you're doing your job. And how do you get from Oklahoma out to Okinawa? Was it was it one more step, or do we have more in between? Well, that was the, that was the next duty station, actually. Okay. So um, they had a billet available in Okinawa, and when I got into my window to choose orders, um, they had that billet. Well, coincidentally, I had just enough time left on my contract that I would be eligible for those orders because it was a three-year billet, and because I had enlisted for four years with a one-year extension, I was going to potentially get to Okinawa right around my two-year mark if I was selected for them, and then I would have the three years on. So that's exactly what ended up happening. Um, I, the, the command let me go about five months early. Um, one month of it I spent on leave in May to June, the early May to early June of uh, 2008, and you know they released me early, and I went on over to Okinawa and I got here the first time uh, June the 8th of 2008 and checked into my command over here uh, at that time uh, June the 12th of 2008 and I was there it was supposed to be a three-year billet but of course I enjoyed it so much that I extended for a fourth year and you know I was the assistant instructor for one of the two main guys well, really the only two guys that was teaching Ishin do karate over here anymore. So he was teaching on one of the Marine Corps bases, and he also has a dojo in town. Um, I primarily would go to the class on the Marine Corps base, but every now and again I would go to the dojo out in town. And anytime... Did I hear you right? There are two people left teaching Ishin do karate on Okinawa? Right, only two. Wow, that blows my mind. But Shortly before I came over here the first time, there were as many as about five people that were teaching it, but I don't know exactly when all of those other three schools closed, but little by little, they closed down, and so by the time I got here, there were really only two left. Mm. Uh, one person's uh, wife had passed away, I found it out, and that's when he got depressed and closed the school, and he had had a falling out with uh, Uezu Angi who was the son-in-law of the founder of our style. Um, Matsumoto Shinsei was his name. Uh, I don't know exactly when his wife passed away or when he closed the school, but it wasn't too long before I got here, I found it out. Mm. Um, and then Uezu Sensei himself, he, um, he had a stroke in 1994, and he had passed his association uh, along to Weichi Suyoshi. And, but, but by the time I got to Okinawa, though, they had uh, parted ways, and 
Koichi Sensei had uh, started his own uh, association in 2007. So I was one of the early members of that and I was his assistant instructor. And the other uh, Okinawan gentleman was Shinobuku Kichiro, who is the oldest son of the founder. And he's still teaching to this day. Mm. He's uh, 81 now, I believe. So you got there on the 12th? I'm, I'm guessing you yeah. were went out looking for, for where you were going to train on the 13th? Well, no, actually, um, I knew where I was going to train because oh. my sensei and I, so after I made Shodan in, uh, in October of 2000, uh, I had actually got promoted by a guy in Texas. And the people in Louisiana that, that knew me and that I respected, I, I did not want them to uh, think for a moment that I was not being honest about having been promoted uh, to black belt there in Texas. But the, the gentleman that I had been promoted by, they had never heard of. So even though he had a legitimate lineage back to the founder, they never knew who this guy was. So I just felt it was in my best interest to, to retest for Shodan. Mm. And so when I did the very next month in November of 2000, um, my present teacher, he was there at that test as a figurehead. And he actually was a student of Shinobuku Tatsuo when he was in the Marine Corps station over here in the late 50s and early 60s. And he invited me to come train with him since I ended up I found it out that we only lived about 30 minutes away from one another. He lived in Dallas proper, and I lived up in McKinney at that time. So uh, it just made more sense. And not that there was anything wrong with Harvey Kennedy and his instruction or anything like that. It just, it was more geographically uh, appropriate, I suppose, uh, for me to go train with Mr. Johnson, Ed Johnson. Sure. And so that's, you know, I switched over to being under him and, there never seemed to be any kind of uh, problem in doing that. Uh, Mr. Kennedy uh, knew Mr. Johnson for years and years, and, and I'm still in good terms with, uh, with Mr. Kennedy and the other people that I've trained with over the years and the other styles and the other Shindu teachers that I've trained with too. So, you know, I don't see the, the problem, but I've been uh, under Sensei Johnson for 20 years this year. Wow, it's a long time. What's different about training on Okinawa than in southern in the southern U.S.? Oh, uh, before I forget, though, um, you had asked about who I was going to train with and stuff. So, oh, yeah. Yeah, so Sensei Johnson, uh, he asked me, he said, well, when you get to Okinawa, uh, who do you want to train with? And I said, well, I know Sensei, who do you want me to train with? And I said, do you want me to train with uh, Kichiro Sensei or do you want me to train with Weichi Sensei? And he said, well, I'll be training with Weichi Sensei. I said, okay. Um, so that's what I did. So about, I want to say probably two days maybe after I got there. It was it was the first week. Um, <laughs> I took a taxi down to the Marine Corps base because I was living on the Kadena Air Base in one of the hotels on the base for the first couple of weeks until I got a house out in town. And so I took the took the taxi and came on down to the Marine Corps base and and I had uh, and I, actually I'd already met Weichi Sensei back in 1994 when he and the Wazu Sensei had come to Louisiana to Mr. Kennedy's place. So I told him, you know, who I was, not that he would have remembered me necessarily, but, um, you know, I, I told him about that. And he remembered, of course, going to Louisiana at that time and coming to that school. And so, I mean, I was able to show the pictures of me and, and Wazu Sensei and stuff. So he knew that I, that was me and he may have recognized me at that time, but who knows, he's taught hundreds of students since, since then, you know, been all yeah. over the United States giving seminars and stuff. But uh, anyway, so, you know, I just, I was a, a Yondan at the time. And so, uh, you know, I, I would help him teach. And in those days, anytime he would go abroad to, to teach, I was teaching his classes for him. And the reason why uh, he allowed me to do that was because right after I got there the very first time, and, you know, he wanted to see how I did kata, and so we did cut the side by side. And the first thing that he said when we were done, he said, almost same. Mm, that's so, quite the compliment. Uh, yes, thank you. And uh, his, his big deal has been, this is one of the reasons or probably the main reason why he and Oasis Sensei had, a, had their falling out, which they have seemed to have mended fences since then now. But, you know, back then it was very controversial. Um, he did not realize that Oasis Sensei in his opinion, 
was not doing things like the founder. And when he made a visit to the United States in late 2001, uh, he was finally able to see the films of Shimabuku Sensei that were shot in 1966. And he'd been training in Ishinyu for a quarter century at that point, basically, and had no idea. Mm. So he got back to Okinawa. He you know, asked Weizu Sensei about it. And Weizu Sensei told him, yeah, that he had made some changes. And so um, that didn't sit well with him. And he decided, hey, well, now that Weizu Sensei has had these uh, strokes, uh, and I'm in charge of the association, I, what I think I'll do is, you know, get things back closer to what we can see the founder doing on the film. Mm. So that, that didn't sit well with a lot of people. And so uh, he felt inclined to, to, to depart that association, and, and he went off on his own for a number of years before he eventually started his own association. Uh, but he kind of inherited that class there at Marine Corps Base Camp Foster from the Weizu Sensei, and Weizu Sensei eventually, you know, closed the dojo. I don't know exactly what year it was, but um, the association that Weizu Sensei had started back in the late 80s is, is basically, for all intents and purposes, defunct here in Okinawa. And he's passed it on to uh, an American uh, there in the States, uh, Mr. Christopher Chase. And that's his, you know, his successor in the association. But Weizu Sensei started his own association and uh, his main thing has been trying to get the kata back to what the founder can be seen to do on the films, you know, and uh, granted, you know, there, you can argue various points about the films that we have of the founder, because he was not really going full speed or full power in these things. He was mainly walking through them, uh, you know, just for the sake of doing them, basically, because I guess he felt like he was... Uh, he kind of owed Steve Armstrong for bringing him over to that visit. And you know, I, I've heard a story about the about that tape, and I've seen I've seen the video. Uh, and and maybe maybe you've heard this, maybe you can disprove this. I I, I don't know. Uh, so at, at this point, this is conjecture. This is what I was told. I'm not saying it is true. I was told he was drunk, that they had to get him drunk well, because he didn't want to record. I I don't I don't know about that. I have not heard that specific thing. I mean I. Shimabuka Sensei, uh, by many accounts, like to socialize quite a bit. And Okinawans, when they socialize, they, they, you know, they like to drink. So I'm not saying that he was never drunk, but as far as, <laughs> as, far as how that plays into having a film made, I do not know. Okay. Um, because I, if you've ever read Steve Armstrong's book, I mean, it's very clear in there that that was the reason why he wanted to have Master Shimabuka come back to the United States. Hmm. He'd already come over in late 64 for three months and didn't feel like he uh, wanted to come back because he felt overworked and mistreated. And there was uh, another opportunity for him to come back over, as it turned out, and he agreed to come over, which that also was not without a problem. But um, at any rate, he made the films for Armstrong, I guess, probably because, you know, Armstrong wanted him to and you know, he kind of felt like he owed him, I guess. I don't know. I mean, I, since I wasn't alive back then and wasn't involved in it, you know, I, of course, I don't know all of the ins and outs of it, but right. Mr. Armstrong made it clear in his book that, you know, that was one of the main reasons why he wanted the master to come back, was so he could film him doing all the kata. So while Master Shimabuku may not have intended for the films that were made to be the standard, Mr. Armstrong sure did. Hmm. So Weichi Sensei, uh, you know, has seen these films, and now he's He's been trying to make things back like the film, uh, like the presentation that the founder put on, for good or bad, you know. And there are things on the film that the founder did that he didn't teach. So a, a lot of people don't realize this. I come across people that don't. Uh, there's a difference between what Tatsuo Shimabuku allowed in the dojo and what Shimabuku Sensei also specifically taught. And then there's what he did in his own practice, too which was sometimes different from what he did and what he taught. Mm. I would suspect that's true of just about every instructor. I mean, the, the, the gap between the two might differ from instructor to instructor, but yeah. you've spent time teaching. I've spent time teaching. I'm sure many of our listeners have spent time teaching. And yeah, you strive for perfection as you understand it, but well, you've got to help people get there. Right. And, uh, but another thing was we didn't have 
the founder who really provided the standardization that these Marines who were used to order and discipline mm -hmm. would have preferred, you know. He was a little bit seemingly lackadaisical about things, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, you know, the Okinawan people, a lot of times, they're, you know, it doesn't have to be only one way. There, there's many, many ways to do karate, and they're all just as valid. You know, and Shimabuka sensei having trained in the older styles and took what he felt were the best elements of those older styles, he very well would know that, you know, just because it was a different style didn't mean that any of the techniques in it were wrong or bad. So, you know, he, he just put together what he felt were the best elements. But he wasn't the only teacher to do that, you know. Shiko Ryu is another example of a blending of Boju Ryu and Shorin Ryu. And, you know, back prior to Shimabuku's day, people were studying with various people. So there, there weren't styles per se, it was all karate back in the late 1800s, yeah. and the early 1900s. But until about the, the 1930s, that style names started popping up, really. <clears throat> So there was the blending going on all the time. It was, you know, a teacher might know two or three kata, and then they would, you know, write a letter of introduction and say, "Hey, go to, down here to this village and train with whoever, because they're a specialist in such and such." You know, <clears throat> so there was a lot of cross pollination back in the day. But Shimabuka Sensei, he would, uh, you know, dabble in various uh, ways of doing things. You know, I talked to several first generation people that trained with the founder, and you know, for instance, Bill Bond, he told me that he uh, used to try to watch the founder very closely so he could do it just like him. Mm. And that he was getting, you know, kind of frustrated because Shimabuku Sensei would do something different seemingly almost in every performance. So, you know, while he never did overhaul the style once he had it in place in the late 40s and early 50s, he kind of tinkered around with timing on things and some techniques here and there. You know, but largely it was, he had the, he had the kata in there that he wanted, and you know had the basics in there that he wanted, and you know there wasn't really a whole lot of evolution after the early fifties. He just didn't name it Ishinryu until 1956. Hmm. <clears throat> so, but at one point in about 1963 or thereabouts, you know he allowed some of the students that wanted to do the twist punch to do the twist punch. So depending on when some of the Marines learned from him, if it was during that two or three year period or so then they learned to shoot you with a twist punch. And that wasn't wrong, it was just different, you know. And he also went back to doing the down block with the bone, with the outside edge of the um, ulna, mm. you know. And then he kept that middle block and the high block with the muscle, you know, but uh, he was doing that low block with the with the bone. And you can even see him doing that on the film in 1966, yeah. doing that bone block for the down block. And then uh, eventually when he went back in probably early 1967 to Okinawa, you know, he had seen everybody in the States pretty much doing it the way he had originally envisioned, so he switched it back. And so everybody else since that time was doing the, you know, the muscle blocks there and the vertical punch. For listeners that might not be familiar with what we're talking about, in the majority of martial arts, when you throw a punch, your palm starts up and finishes down. What we're talking about with Ishinru is that there isn't generally much, if any, rotation that the thumb is on top of the fist and it, the fist is vertical and stays that way through and some of the some of the blocks traditionally come in that position so it's uh it's it's visually very different and if and if you've trained yeah. in it it is quite different in the way that you utilize it well but see some people think that shimabuku was a you know a pioneer in doing that well not necessarily i mean his teacher his primary teacher at Kan Tofoku, that was a specialty punch using the vertical fist to the face. Nagamine Shoshin wrote about that. Mm. And Otobuchoki also was another one of Shinobuku's teachers briefly. And he also used that vertical punch. You know, he used the, the one knuckle sticking out uh, and he also may have used the vertical punch as well. But Motobu was well known for holding the fist in a vertical position and striking with that index finger knuckle. So that to me, it's a, it's a possibility that Tatsuo Sensei's uh, usage of the vertical fist as his primary weapon for his style was to pay tribute to his teachers in a way. Hmm. You know, he I, felt like it was so strong. I see that. Yeah. If but you yeah, were. So styles have the vertical fist, they just don't use it as their primary weapon like we do. Right. And the thumb is generally not on top. My, That's correct. Everywhere I've ever seen it, the thumb maintains its, its position uh, underneath the fingers. 
but there actually are lots and lots of people who, in my estimation, are not really placing the sun in the correct spot. We have photographs of early Okinawan uh, or early American students training over here, uh, and they're doing the fist just like Tatsuo used to do it himself. We got pictures of Tatsuo himself holding the fist with the, you know, the, the tip of the thumb basically on the first knuckle of the index finger and lying it down so that the, the thumb joint is lying across the top of the index finger. But yet you'll have people that'll uh, have their thumb on the second knuckle of the index finger and having the thumb sticking straight up to the sky. And that's not really how Tatsuo did it. So the purpose of this thumb on the top is you lie the thumb down and you squeeze it. And that's what allows the fist to be tighter on the back side of the hand or the knuckle bar, the top of the knuckle bar. And in the doing, it makes the wrist tighter. Hmm. Wow. And if I can you were to... that if you'd like. What's that? I can send you some photographs if you like that I'm talking about, so you can see that the hand position and stuff. You know, and I, I actually have yeah. done it correctly too, and I've been doing it wrong for probably you know uh, like ten or eleven years or whatever. <laughs> finally, I saw a video of uh, the younger son of the founder, and I said, "Oh my goodness, I've been doing this wrong all this time." And so when I placed my hand in the same position, I could see the the founder's younger son doing. I could immediately tell that that was a much stronger fist position than what I had been doing. So I was very happy to have that little correction. Mm. And then, of course, I went back and looked at some of the old photographs, and I'm like, oh, sure enough, there it is, all along. <laughs> Let's talk about the martial arts culture on Okinawa, yeah. because anybody who's trained any martial art, I'm sure at some point has said, you know, that that it, maybe, maybe they don't have strong desire to go there and train, but they recognize the significance. And I'm sure a lot of us have these ideas of what it would be like to train over there. And I'm wondering if you might compare, you know, you, you, you trained in a few places in the US and then you went to Okinawa and you're training there. How different is it? Well, uh, by and large, Okinawa and Dojo focus a lot on body conditioning. And some styles do it with the, you know, the Hojo Lingo equipment that you may be familiar with. Shiyushi and Ishisashi and so on. Um, American dojos don't do that a lot that I've seen. I mean, I know there are some, of course, and there probably are many that do, but I, I think that probably the majority of them don't um, for whatever reason. Maybe they're not aware of it. Maybe they just prefer to not do it in the class. I, I don't know. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of body conditioning involved. Most of the I, I think I have yet to find a dojo over here that has an air conditioning. Mm. So it's awful, awful hot, even huh. in the winter time. What, what's, yeah. what's the average temperature over there? Well, temperature-wise, it probably doesn't get higher than the low 90s, but with the humidity, which is usually very high, you know, eight, like 85% or greater, mm. you know, it makes it really, really hot. Um, there's only been a few instances over here that, I actually got bothered by the humidity because I'm from the South. So I can do the hot, uh, dry heat of Texas. I can do the hot, humid heat of Louisiana. So it never really bothered me. And even when I went, when I was stationed in Korea, uh, I had people complaining about the humidity there. I said, oh, this is nothing. <laughs> it's like 15 percentage points higher in humidity in Okinawa than it is in Korea. It seemed like. So mm. it didn't bother me at all. But yeah, it's awful hot, especially in the summertime over here. And it rains a lot too, and I know that there's technically a rainy season here, but really it can rain all year round. <laughs> and when they have the typhoons, the typhoon season runs from the beginning of June to the end of November. You know, you never know what you're going to get as far as typhoons go, but man, they can rain, rain, rain. Not all of them make landfall, of course, but some of them do periodically. Mostly we just get the wind and the rain, and you know, it can rain for for like two and a half days straight mm -hmm. or more. I mean, just constant. So it's pretty wild. Let's see, um, you asked about Okinawan dojos. The side yeah. from that, uh, every single one that I've been in has a hardwood floor. Um, like I say, very hot in there. Um, most of them are relatively small. Um, they 
focus on quantity of the material that's taught. Um, so while they may have a larger curriculum than what they teach, they teach it very slowly. So they focus on what is more important to the teacher to teach, you know, mm. the basics of the style and a few kata. And then if the student can, you know, digest it all, then of course they, they get more and more of it. But what about things like uh, etiquette and titles and rank and all that? You know, I'm, I'm sure you're aware here in the U.S. and even other parts of the uh, parts of the world, we often get wrapped up in all that. There's a lot of conversation about that. What's it like on Okinawa? Well, um, you know, rank is it's not really all that important over here necessarily. I mean, they have it, of course, and you know they utilize it, but by and large, they want the student to focus on the material, not the rank. And you know, some teachers are very strict about how they promote somebody, but you know, Americans largely uh, place will will place a large emphasis on, on shodan, you know, first degree black belt. And while it is a big deal over here too, it's not nearly as big a deal over here as it is in the United States. You know, so it's still a beginner rank over here, basically. And so... What do you mean by that? Well, as the average student can make black belt here in about two years. If they're training on a regular basis and they know the material, you know, the teacher will probably promote them after a couple of years. Whereas in the States, you know, a lot of schools will put will basically pride themselves on saying, oh, well, you know, it's going to take upwards of three to five years or more to make black belt for my school or whatever. And, and honestly, I don't know what the big thing is and why it would need to be that long, you know. But Shodan, you know, they don't write the character with the character for one, for like first degree. Shodan is more like a small level of knowledge. So it's, it's starting over again, basically. You just been initiated into the club, so to speak. You're now a ranked student, a yudansha versus a mudansha. And, you know, you, you essentially know the material well enough that you don't necessarily have to have your instructor harping on you all the time, but it's really not the end-all be-all like some people make it out to be in the United States. It's hmm. good to hear. So sandan is basically the first level that you can really be a sensei. You know, um, maybe some other styles would do fourth bond or something, you know, to be a sensei, but you're typically not an autonomous instructor until you're a godan, you know, and that's about the time that you could be a shihan. Shihan is a generic word that basically means chief instructor, you know, and, and it's not a title that's to be bestowed on anybody like a lot of people will do. And, and there's all kinds of things. Sensei is not really a title to be bestowed on somebody like on a rank certificate or anything. It's just, it's just kind of you assume that that role as a sensei, you know. Most people in the states they call a black belt instructor, you know, or somebody with a black belt sensei, mostly to be respectful and polite, and I get that. But not everybody is a sensei just because they have a black belt over here, at least, you know. What about competition? Well, they have them. There's different karate associations, uh, and they have competitions now. I'm not aware of all of them. Um, I never really tried to find out where all of them are, but there is a, an annual tournament that I compete in. And whenever I have students who are able to do so, I have them competing in as well. The Uruma City Karate Federation has a tournament every September. And um, I get invited to it every year by a Goju Ryu Sensei. He's a fire inspector down at White Beach, actually. And so, you know, if you live in Uruma City or if you have a karate school in Uruma City or if you attend a karate school in Uruma City, you're allowed to go to this uh, tournament or be in the tournament. I mean, anybody can go to it, but I mean, to actually compete in it, you're supposed to, you know, be attending a school or have a school or live there in Uruma City. So. And it's held in one of the local high schools. You know, they have like a, a, a kendo uh, karate dojo in the back of a high school and uh, you know they have tournaments in there every year and i've also been to uh, other facilities on the island that are larger of course and they have really good turnouts for those tournaments i was in the, the world tournament they had in 2009 and uh, i went to the one that they had in 2018 i didn't compete in it but i, I watched some of it let's imagine that tomorrow your instructor comes to you and says, you know what? I'm kicking you out. Not for bad reasons, but 
it's time for you to go off and, and do something else. And, and at the same time, the Navy says, and we'll even put you up somewhere else. You, you can, you can you know, be stationed anywhere. And, and let's say even to further this crazy hypothetical, if there's no Naval base there, we'll build one just for you. <laughs> Where would you want to go and what would you want to train? Well, uh, aside from being here in Okinawa, um, really the only other place I wouldn't mind going would be somewhere in Europe, you know. I've, I've only been to Europe one time and only recently at that, last uh, October, I took my wife to, to France and, uh, you know, but every now and again when I was up for orders, I would see, you know, different billets in Europe and Germany or Belgium or something, you know, Spain, and so I thought it'd be kind of neat to, to go to, to Belgium something like that. And what would you want to train there, if not Ishinru? And not something's oh. too close. To so Ishinru. are you saying that I would need to do a different martial arts yeah. situation? Yeah, we're, oh. we're, we're trying to drill into your head with, without, uh, without the okay. permanent well, injury. I mean, hypothetically, I, if that was the case and I was no longer to do Ishinru and I was going to be in Europe or something, you know, I might try, try my hand at Savat or something like that, hmm. you know? Why does, why does that jump out for you? Well, because it wouldn't necessarily be too different from, you know, my background. I've done Taekwondo and I've done boxing and kickboxing and stuff like that. So it would be neat to see what authentic savat technique is like, you know. That was nice. I had uh, a very, uh, well, very good is, is an understatement. He was an excellent boxing and kickboxing coach and he unfortunately passed away a couple of years ago but mm. I've spent it for like 18 years almost my entire adult life um, sorry to hear that thank you he was a gentleman from Milwaukee Wisconsin <clears throat> and he moved down to the Dallas area uh, about 1999 I believe and I was one of the first friends that he made there in the Texas Dallas Texas area I was one of his students at the community college he used to teach the cardio kickboxing so he could do it all he could do the full contact he could do the sport karate fighting. He could do that. He later got into Muay Thai and started doing all that. And he was excellent at whatever he did. He was kind of a, a, a somewhat of a local celebrity in the martial arts community here yeah. in the Dallas area. Sounds like a real interesting person. That's great. And Lee Wilson was his name. Very, very decent person. And, uh, you know, very sad that he passed away. Sure. He had a heart attack. <clears throat> And he's only in his early 50s. Wow. But he was one of my dear friends, and he was a really excellent coach. But uh, let's see, anything else? Uh, well, how, about, how about the future? You know, we've talked about the now. We've talked about the, the, the before. Okay. You know, if, if, we, uh, if we did this, if we got back together some point in the future, I'll let you pick the time. And I said, what have you been up to martial arts wise since we last spoke? What would you hope you were going to tell me? Well, I guess it might depend on how, how far out in the future this, uh, you know, that we get back together. But, uh, you know, I have a plan to hopefully get some of the, or most of the students that I've been teaching over the years that are, you know, fairly close to black belt that, uh, you know, they, so when you're in the military, you're either transferring to your next duty station or your students are, if, if you are teaching martial arts. Mm -hmm. And so you never know uh, how long you'll have with somebody. Uh, and not always are you fortunate enough to have some folks to start with you, like right after they get to wherever, you know, they, they've been stationed. But in my case, I've got uh, three individuals that, you know, started with me just recently and fairly close to the beginning of their tour and I'm still going to be here until 2023 as I said so I'm hoping to get those guys you know promoted to, to black belt during that time um, and then I have some students that are scattered throughout the United States that I've taught over the years and um, I got a, one that still lives up in mainland Japan that I used to teach in Korea um, but he's he's retired actually he's not stationed there anymore I should say he's just retired he was in Air Force and now he's retired but lives up there in Japan, I'd like to get some of these guys up to black belt finally, you know. It's kind of difficult to do that when you're no longer, you know, face to face with them. Uh, but, you know, with the technology of Zoom and things like that, you know, I think that they could learn the remainder of the curriculum that they need. And then, you know, maybe in 2022 or thereabouts, 
maybe they could test for their black belt finally. Um, it would be really nice. I've uh, in all the years that I've been teaching, actually, I, I've never had any of my own students go all the way from white belt to black belt. Mm. But I have promoted uh, a couple of other people to black belt that weren't my students. So that was kind of an interesting scenario. Yeah. I'm sure it's quite the challenge to end up with people at, at different phases in their training. And, and certainly, you know, other instructors have to deal with this, but I would imagine in the military, it's something you deal with far more frequently. So, um, in the future, well, I mean, I want to continue to teach, of course, and my, I think I probably mentioned it in the bio that uh, I sent you that, you know, I do a fair amount of volunteer work and my volunteer work that I do is teaching. So, um, that's what my passion is, is to help others uh, and while I'm on active duty, I don't charge for karate lessons. The students got to buy their manual, their student manual, and their equipment and stuff, you know, uniforms and whatnot. But outside of that, the lessons themselves, I don't charge for. And, you know, I, I intend to continue doing that. And eventually, when I get out of the Navy, then I want to have a school. Hmm. So, like I said, depending on when we get back together, if it's, you know, really far in the future, then then hopefully I'll have a school going by then. But in the meantime, I'll just teach kind of in a private lesson setting. You know, I have hmm. a handful of students at once here and there. So. Sounds great. And if people want to reach you, is there their, you know, social media, website, email, anything like that that you're willing to give out publicly? Sure. I'm, uh, I'm easy to find on Facebook, Andy Sloan. And uh, my email address has been the same since uh, about... 2002, karateusa at hotmail.com. And I have a Magic Jack phone number that has a United States phone number. So anybody can call me on that as well if they like. Um, I can give that phone number out, 972-886-5924. It's a Dallas area phone number, but it, it runs here at my computer. Great. Well, I thank you for being here today. And we always ask our guests, kind of the same question, but they take it in different ways. What parting words, wisdom, advice, whatever you want to call it, would you choose to close out this episode? Well, uh, I, uh, I saw a motivational uh, saying at a dojo back in 2005 in South Louisiana, and I, it's always stuck with me, and I like to tell my students about it. You know, it said, uh, perfection is our goal. Excellence will be tolerated. So everybody just strive to do the best you can at whatever art that you uh, choose to train in. And it doesn't matter what art, just do the best you can to build yourself up and build your students up and, you know, be a good influence on people and try to, try to be a good uh, example to people in the community. I want to thank Sensei Sloan for staying up so late to talk to me, to share his journey, to share that story with all of us that, Let's be honest, I think quite a few of us can see some of ourselves in there and also see some things that we would love to do. How many of us who grew up or train in karate now would love to spend time living in Okinawa? We've heard from guests who have moved to the birthplace of their art, but regardless of what that art is, in fact, I think we've talked to people from who are now living in every country that is known for traditional arts and the passion that comes through. That's what I took from this episode. Sensei is passionate about his training, and he's found a way to incorporate it into his entire life. So thank you, sir. Thanks for joining us, and I hope to connect with you again soon. If you want to connect with the show, go to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com, and if you want to connect with everything that we're doing, it's whistlekick.com. If you value what we're putting out, please help us out. Whistlekick.com, make a purchase, podcast 15 to save 15%, or the Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com slash whistlekick, two bucks and up a month. And of course, sharing the episodes, helping us reach new people, all of that is valuable to us as well. If you see somebody rocking some whistlekick gear out somewhere, chat them up. Could be your next training partner. And if you've got guest suggestions or other feedback, make sure you email me, jeremy at whistlekick.com. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day. 